the Brown Pundits Browncast. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Brown Pundits Browncast. My name is Manish Taneja. This is the eighth episode in our series of podcasts on the history of the Indian subcontinent. In this episode, we'll talk about the Guptas, a dynasty that ruled north and northwest of the subcontinent from the period 4th century AD to about 6th century AD. Joining me in the episode as speakers are Gaurav Lele and Jay Vardhan Singh. Welcome to the episode, gentlemen. Hello. Welcome to the episode, gentlemen. Thank you. Right. Hi. So let's get started. Uh, Gaurav, Jay. Jay, I'll start with you. Who were the early Guptas? Uh, What's their backstory? What is the Mm. earliest evidence we have of the Gupta Empire? Uh, Now, uh, when we are talking about the Guptas, we are essentially talking about the Imperial Guptas. But when it comes to the origin of Gupta or uh, as you have said that early Guptas, the problem is that we uh, there is this great debate among historians about uh, what was their base and you know uh, from uh, from which varna they belong uh, so when we you know analyze different uh, inscriptions we find that the term gupta as a name appears in the you know there were some officers of the satvahanas as well who had this gupta term associated with their name then we have early Brahmi inscriptions from 1st century BC to 2nd century CE, where, you know, this term Gupta appears. But when we look at the chronologies of the Guptas, we find that the uh, first Gupta ruler was Shri Gupta, or sometimes the term Maharaj Gupta is also used. But when you, uh, you know, analyze this term per se, so some of uh, some of us, uh, us have this mis- misconception that you know uh, Gupta was a surname, but uh, when you look at this, uh, you know the first ruler of the Gupta, the Shri Gupta or Maharaj Gupta. So Gupta is not a surname; it is a uh, you know first name. So, for example, you know there is this another dynasty called the Palas who ruled Bang- uh, Bengal during in a later period. So here also we see that, you know, the first ruler has the term Gopal. So because of this, uh, some historians have argued that uh, the term Gupta was not, you know, uh, was not a surname. It was a title. And the later Gupta rulers adopted this title. Now about the Varnas of the Guptas, because, you know, it is quite an important uh, issue when it comes to the history of the Guptas. uh, So from which one they, these Guptas belong. So uh, like many topics of ancient Ind- Indian history, we have you know three types of theory. So some historians argue that these Guptas were Vaish, some say they were uh, Kshatriya, and some say they were Brahmans. Now, uh, I personally think that it is either, they were either Kshatriya or they were either Brahman. Now, uh, you know, the amount of evidence we have about these early Guptas, particularly the three Gupta rulers. So first is Shri Gupta, second is Ghatotkaj Gupta, and the third is Chandragupta first. So about the uh, particularly about the first two Gupta rulers, we have only their name in in chronologies that appear uh, that were uh, you know uh, commissioned by the later Gupta rulers. So because of this uh, historians have to rely you know have to do some logical reasoning in order to understand uh, in order to find out how what type of varna these gupta rulers had so i think i will give you an example where you see the same argument is used by uh, proponents of kshatriya theory and also the proponents of brahman theory so uh, historians argue that during the period when you know uh, gupta ruled there was this concept that uh, the anulom marriage. So anulom marriage is a marriage in which a person, a male of higher varna, can uh, marries a female of a lower varna. Whereas pratilom marriage is is opposite. So a female of a higher varna marries a uh, male of a lower varna. So during the period of the Guptas, uh, according to Dharma Shastra the anulom marriage was allowed. So a person of, a man of a higher one 
can marry a woman of a lower world so because of this uh, we uh, uh, some historians have argued that uh, we have this evidence where you know uh, the daughter uh, one of the gupta princes uh, whose name was prabhavati gupt uh, she was the daughter of chandragupt ii uh, so she married a vakataka uh, prince so uh, some historians argue that uh, since prabhavati gupt was a since guptas were a kshatriya they married uh, the vakatakas who were brahmana so a kshatriya woman marries a brahmana woman so that is anlom marriage so this is this is the reason why gupta must be, the guptas must be kshatriya now the same you know evidence is used by the proponents of brahman theory who say that uh, these both dynasties were brahmana that is why this marriage happened so uh, so uh, my main argument is that we essentially don't know about their varna about the base of the uh, these early guptas or the area where these early guptas ruled here again we see that you know there is no consensus among historians so we have you know three options so first is eastern up the region of you know present day from prayag to the boundary of bihar then the second theory argues that it is the region of magadh which was the center of the early guptas then we have another theory which argues that the uh, region of uh, bengal particularly western bengal was the base of the guptas particularly the early guptas but here when you analyze the early gupta coins uh, and also early gupta inscriptions that were found most likely it appears that eastern up was the base of the early guptas you know another important point which you know supports this theory is that one of the main uh, most important inscription of the guptas was it was a prashasti or you know eulogy by a, of a gupta king called samudragupta i think most of us have heard uh, the name of this king now the fact that this important inscription was you know was placed in prayag although right now it is in ilahabad but most scholars believe that earlier it was situated in uh, kosam which is uh, which is in the ilahabad district but not the ilahabad city itself so the fact that you know this imp- this important inscription was situated in in ilahabad region suggest that you know ilahabad region for the early guptas was a important territory so that is why we can say that the uh, the base of the early guptas was eastern up and uh, uh, the uh, the the first gupta ruler shri gupta you know before the coming of the guptas this territory was ruled by a dynasty called the magas and we see that uh, uh, shri gupta around 250 ad to 270 ad there is no exact date so around the end of 3rd century ad shri gupta establishes his rule over the eastern up region then he is uh, you know uh, then c- comes his son ghatotkach gupta about him we do not know anything else about uh, other than his name then the third ruler of the guptas whose name was uh, chandragupta first this it is from uh, his reign onwards we see that you know the rise of the guptas truly happen so i think i will stop now right thanks for that gorav what have you read about the early guptas what do we know how the dynasty was founded who did they succeed who were the early founders of this dynasty yeah so to supplement what jay just said uh, after the fall of the kushanas uh, around the turn of the second century uh, this political uh, region of north india was not ruled by a powerful empire or even a large kingdom so to speak so by the time of the um, first major gupta ruler chandragupta first chandragupta first a uh, couple of powers were taking rise in the north indian region so one of them are the nagas uh, actually jay himself has made a great video on nagas so viewers can check that out but uh, we don't know much about them where did they come from and how they began ruling but they seems to have uh, ruled uh, north india around bundelkhand or padmavat these uh, is their capital city so on so that is one big power emerging and to the south 
uh, another power which we talked about some time ago uh, the vakatakas who were who are also claimed uh, to be brahmanas so that power uh, also rose and at the same time chandragupta first was also apparently gaining power in the alabad region as per uh, the logic we came up with some time ago so uh, it seems the reason guptas became on the came on the forefront was the matrimonial matrimonial alliance the guptas had with the lichavids so in this podcast when we talked about the magadha region and about ajata shatru we talked about how ajata shatru conquered the uh, eastern republics vrijis and one of the major clans among the vrijis whom uh, ajata shatru conquered in uh, making magad a uh, empire so of sorts was the lichavis so uh, chandragupta married into the lichavi clan he married kumara kumara devi and that seems to have been a reaction to the matrimonial alliances between the two other giant players the vakatakas and the nagas and uh, it is fair to assume that this matrimonial alliance actually put the smallish guptas on to the grand stage so within a generation uh, a region which had many small powers vying for power uh, one big boy the guptas under the successor of uh, chandragupta uh, who uh, jay talked about some time ago samudra gupta so that is when the gupta empire as we call it like the empire began with uh, maybe chandragupta first or more probably under samudra gupta who uh, has to be has to go down as one of the most uh, brilliant conquerors this country has ever seen so the amount of conquering he did uh, which is mostly taken from the alabad uh, prashasti which i talked about some time ago so he is sort of the maker of the empire so that's where guptas right. became an empire from a kingdom right we'll come to that so what we are saying is by the end of the kushan empire the political map of north india is in a flux we know there is a kingdom of nagas we also know vakatakas are there and then there is the small kingdom around eastern up of the guptas and because of matrimonial alliances the guptas sort of uh, gain power over or become more powerful than the other kingdoms and then the succeeding rulers spread the empire would that be the right submission yes yeah you right Fair enough. Now, uh, moving on, just for our listeners, can we take them through the chronology of rulers? Uh, so it starts with the Shri Gupta, uh, Maharaj Gupta, as uh, Jay mentioned. Uh, Jay, if you could take us through the chronology of the various rulers. Uh, yes, sure. Uh, so uh, first two rulers. And if you are... could also tell us the years in which they ruled, uh, if whatever we know of that, the period for which they ruled. Hmm. Uh, so uh, first is uh, Shri Gupta. second is ghatot kachkut now about these two rulers we don't have any chronologies but what you uh, what what we can say is that uh, most likely they ruled between the period of around uh, 280 ad to uh, 320 ad now the period 320 uh, sorry the date to uh, 320 ad is important because in the gupta inscription from this period onwards this becomes the gupta era so now uh, like uh, like many topics of ancient indian history historians are not clear whether uh, this gupta era was the you know uh, this was the date on which you know chandragupta first ascended the throne or was it you know uh, the next ruler of the guptas whose name was samudragupta so we are not sure but you know major uh, the historical con- consensus is that 320 AD was the uh, date on which uh, Chandragupta first ascended the Gupta throne. Now, after uh, Chandragupta uh, first, Chandragupta first is uh, important because you know uh, earlier the Gupta used to rule this small region of eastern UP. Now, with the alliance, uh, with the matrimony, with the wedding of Kumar Devi with Chandragupta first, the region of Magadh, or particularly the region of Bihar. you know amalgamates into the gupta gupta kingdom 
so suddenly you see you, the size of the gupta empire suddenly increases you know more than doubles but uh, in the chandragupta period we are pretty sure that uh, the lichavis you know lichavis had control over this territory the guptas did not have you know direct control over the lichavi territory but around 335 ad so 330 so around uh, uh, chandragupta first rules around 15 year and after uh, uh, and around 335 ad samudra gupta becomes the next gupta ruler and uh, you know when he succeeds so because he is the son of uh, kumar devi and chandragupta first so the lichavis uh, the territory of the lichavis also become parts of his reign and from samudra gupta's reign we see that you know the real expansion of the guptas uh, takes place right so let's let's go back to the chronology so we know chandragupta one yeah. who is and then followed by samudra gupta and samudra gupta is followed by either ram gupta and or, chandragupta and chandragupta and chandragupta second yeah right and who's who succeeds chandragupta second after chandragupta second comes ram gupta uh, sorry kumar gupta first kumar gupta first and who succeeds kumar gupta first after kumar gupta uh, we have skand gupta now there is again this problem of you know and there was uh, there is a theory there was another gupta prince who after the death of kumar gupta first uh, uh, the hunas have at, uh, have you know invaded india from the north west so during the reign of kumar gupta particularly the uh, end of his reign Uh, some uh, kumar gupt send his prince uh, uh, skand gupt to you know uh, defeat the hunas now uh, when he was uh, you know engaged with the hunas kumar gupt dies and after kumar gupt uh, we see that another gupta prince uh, becomes the ruler of the guptas and when uh, skand gupt has defeated the hunas he come back and he defeat this prince and he becomes the next ruler So, so have, Kumar Gupta is followed by Skand Gupta. Who for, who succeeds Skand Gupta? Now, after Skand Gupta, you know the chronologies of the Guptas is uh, becomes you know quite messy. Where are we? So have, is Skand Gupta? So then, would you say Skand Gupta is the last prominent ruler of the Gupta dynasty? Yes. Yeah. So he was the like uh, as with the Roman emperors, we talk that they are there to be five great Roman emperors. So Skand Gupta is the last great. Gupta Emperor. After that, we have four or five rulers uh, called Buddha Gupta, Kumara Gupta, two, Narasimha Gupta. But they yeah. like after the death of Skanda Gupta, the empire started the downward trajectory. So they are like the later Mughals. Yeah. So for all means and purposes, more you... than more than later Mughals probably they still uh, because there is evidence of the last uh, Gupta Emperor. uh narsim gupt who seems to have defeated the hunas so they sure. seems to have lot of power but they were not the pan india empire which was there at the time of kumara gupt or chandra gupt too uh, i think uh, uh, to you know clear this confusion uh, if you look at the you know chronological terms uh, the period of skand skand gupt uh, skand gupt lasts around 467 ad so after 467 ad and up to 550 ad we have the rule of the later guptas and after 550 ad you know for all means and purposes the gupta empire and the glory of the guptas you know it is you know comes to an end so sure so we'll 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 take a pause there so it starts typically like we discussed at around 320 ad that's when we know chandragupta 1 takes the throne right yes and around 550 ad is then that's when we know after that the later guptas we the glory of the empire is over and they are just another political player in india fine now let's look at the political map of the gupta empire so we said they started in eastern up but of how do with each succeeding king how does this uh, how does this political map spread out yeah so uh, one of the things we need to remember about the gupta state uh is that they were not a centralized polity so that is important when we look at the political map as well so uh the guptas followed the uh, ancient indian term called as rajamandala so the idea is to have a core region of direct political power direct governance followed by vassal states who 
still owe their fealty and allegiance to you and they are followed by uh, states which are not enemies but they are not exactly vassals so that is something we need to keep in mind when we understand the gupta territory otherwise there may be misunderstandings so sure. uh, when we start with chandragupta first uh, the uh, eastern up and uh, magadh region which was still uh, ruled by the lichavis when uh, chandragupta one was in power that seems to be the uh, area where guptas were in rule around the deccan region north of nagpur that was the region of the vakatakas and just north of them there were nagas and after the death of chandragupta first when samudragupta took the reign uh, we are pretty sure that he conquered all the way till Punj- from punjab up till orissa and even down south up till the north of uh, tamil nadu so uh, uh, his alabad prashasti uh, that mentions some uh, 27 or s- some large number of rulers whom he conquered in some cases it is said that he annihilated or killed them outright in some places uh, he uh, subdued them and accepted their fealty in some places he just gave their kingdom back to them so that is important uh, in the rajamandala concept as well so while forming the core of the empire uh, samudragupta must have killed the rulers outright and taken their kingdom by force as he went out he still subdued them maybe took fealty taxes from them but these regions were not directly under the gupta rule so one one example is uh, in the west in the from the punjab till gujarat region the western kshatrapas who were the remnants of the uh, shakas were ruling and in some of their coins they seem to be paying allegiance to samudragupta but that is not the territory where samudragupta had direct uh, control or anything so that's about samudragupta uh, and as uh, we talked about the story of ramagupta and chandragupta there after death of uh, samudragupta there seems to have been some conflict with the shakas or the kshatrapas western kshatrapas with the guptas and it is samudragupta second uh it's chandragupta second who conquered the western kshatrapas and at the time of uh, chandragupta second the gupta empire more or less had power from gujarat or maybe even parts of sindh punjab right up till odisha and also some nominal control in the regions of uh, south whereas the vakatakas who ruled the central deccan plateau they were never directly under the gupta rulership but they were in the matrimonial alliances alliance with guptas and so on they were like we can call them friendly territory or not an enemy territory so that was also a region where guptas had tremendous uh, influence though they were not directly governed by the guptas right and before we move forward uh, chandragupta second we also popularly know him as know him as vikramaditya right yes right right so, so these gupta rulers uh, seem to have taken aditya title so chandragupta second is called uh, vikramaditya his son kumaragupta about whom we talked he is called mahendra aditya so that is the title taken by him uh, i think uh, we we should uh, talk more about you know samudragupta's con- uh, samudragupta con- conquest we will come to that so we were just uh, we'll just sort of plotting the political map of the kingdom so at its peak and the kingdom and the empire reached its peak at the time of chandragupta second yes so so jay uh, let's plot the map of chandragupta second's empire in current uh, political maps of the subcontinent what is the western most point of this empire uh, about chandragupta second you can say that you know the most uh, the region of uh, present day gujarat is Gujarat. you know uh, under the rule of chamutagupta and because uh, you know the major uh, when we are talking about Ch- chandragupta's conquest chandragupta second's conquest uh, we have to you know there are two uh, areas of you know, which he you know there were basically three different regions where he he campaigned so uh, we, i think uh, uh, 
we will talk about these in a in a, in a later you know uh, so i think uh, yeah so the western most point is uh, gujarat what about northwest uh, gaurav just mentioned he also went all the way up till possibly sind then punjab so, so do we know what so was about, the northern northwest boundary of the frontier uh, of the about, empire about the northwest of the guptas uh, sorry chandragupta second's uh, conquest you see we have this flav, uh, famous iron pillar of delhi which is in maroli uh, qutub minar complex so here the, uh, it talks about you know a chandragupta uh, a chandra mentions a someone called chandra now some uh, there is this uh, clear uh, some there is this consensus consensus among the historians that it was chandragupta second and this inscription tells us that chandragupta uh, crossed the seven faced sindhu and the term is used saptamukhani so seven he crossed the seven faced uh, seven faced sindhu and defeated the vahalikas now the vahalikas there is this uh, two uh, versions so vahalika sometimes are described as the, uh, inhabiting the region of punjab but the fact that this inscription talks about you know he crossed the seven faced sindhu means that uh, he may have you know uh, raided the territory of the uh, the region of bulk which is which is you know north of the hindu kush mountain so but this was not a regular conquest it was much more like a punitive expedition because uh, uh, before uh, chandragupta second's reign samundragupta had uh, conquered the territory up to the ravi river and beyond ravi they were you know just paid tribute to samudragupta there was no real conquest and what uh, so where do we so then how do we so where do we draw the boundary so ravi 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 that's the northwest and how about east and how about about east, east you know the same uh, rn pillar inscription talks about the fact that he defeated the kings of the vangas who had united in order to you know defeat in order uh, against him so the defeat of the vangas vang most of the time is the region of western bihar uh, sorry western bengal so it appears that you know samudragupta might have uh, uh, did not conquer this uh, territory properly so the uh, the rulers who had you know just paid tribute to him suddenly after the accession of chandragupta second had become you know want uh, had revolted so he put this revolt to rest and the the western bengal region was also conquered because you know the eastern bengal region during this period was most likely you know was a forested region there was not much inhabited sure sure what about south how far south did they go to narmada 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 river right right Jay, uh, gaurav anything anything that you have to add anything else that you read about this uh yeah so that is the that is the political map but uh, as i talked about earlier the vakadakas who ruled the deccan uh, most of the deccan they were also an ally or a partner so to speak of guptas so one of the most uh, uh, like uh, comprehensive books on this period is also called the vakataka gupta age from 200 like uh, which is written by rc muzumdar i think so that region is not directly under gupta territory but we can consider like it them as close allies especially during the times of chandragupta second and even the early parts of uh, kumaragupta so uh, right i right. just uh, add uh, want to add you know what gaurav ji has said so uh, this alliance of you know vakatikas and guptas so what happened was chandragupta second married his daughter prabhavati gupta to the gupta ruler rudrasen now what we see is that after this marriage rudrasen dies rudrasen second dies and prabhavati gupta becomes the regent of the vakataka empire and the you know her sons were i think around 9 or 10 years of age so they were not adult enough to rule or in their own so what we see is that under her uh, leadership the uh, the influence of the guptas greatly increased in the vakataka kingdom we can say this because you know this uh, there is this nagpur uh, copper plate which is which which talks about you know prabhavati gupta granting a land now in this uh, inscription in this copper plate inscription 
this we find that you know prabhavati gupta mentions her own uh, her own gotra whereas you know one would not expect expect that uh, a queen particularly a queen of the vakartakas who had you know a large kingdom would you know assert his own identity so the fact that he he talks about you know his his father and his gotra and he tells uh, she sorry uh, she she talks about her father and all of this means that you know the guptas uh, the uh, the control of the guptas in the vakartaka territory during the regency of prabhavati gupta was you know greatly in, has greatly been increased right so yeah. we now broadly know how the political map of the gupta empire looked like uh let's talk about right. specific rulers for a while uh so the first one is let's start with chandragupta first uh what what do we know about him uh talk to us about uh, chandragupta so, and what's his legacy so about his personality we uh, really like we don't know that much we know that he formed the matrimonial alliance so uh, the interesting thing about that is on the coins issued by him or in some cases by his son and successor samudragupta uh, both him and kumara devi are given 50 50% footage on the coins and and they have the title lichhavaya so as we talked some time ago by the time chandragupta was in power uh, the lichhavis would have had considerable sway over the uh, magad at least over the patliputra and over the lichhavi lands so he might not have had that much to do apart from maybe consolidating but we don't know much about him uh, personally right uh, about his jay, successor and son uh, yeah okay yeah we'll come to uh, that jay have you read anything about chandragupta one that you would like to talk about uh, no not necessarily anything more about right. what so, quality has so then let's talk about his son samudragupta uh, gaurav what do we know about him so he was like uh, i think history in many ways especially pop history has become a great uh, has been focused a lot on great men so we seem to think that great men do history which is not the truth in most of the cases but i think uh, by my account of my reading samudragupta seems to have been an exception to this rule so the amount of conquests he did uh are really astounding and to for a small player to have that much success in a like in 30 years or so which left a legacy for 200 years to follow so he has to go down uh like in the same uh, conquer uh, same list of conquerors as we say for maybe uh alexander or or the later uh sultanate rulers like khilji who were very successful in their conquest so samudragupta seems to have been uh, first like one of those uh, military geniuses and uh, we talked about uh, kharavela in a previous episodes so uh, kharavela seems to be one of the first uh, emperors north indian emperors who successfully invaded the south according to his own inscriptions but there is some doubt about whether kharavela really uh, managed to invade the south same is true about the mauryas because uh, there seem to be some contrary evidence that mauryas had failed in some of their conquests in the south uh, that is taken from the some uh, uh, little anecdotes in the sangam poetry but about samudragupta we can be pretty sure that he was one of the first conquerors to have managed rule uh, like uh, invading down south even though he did not rule it so that is one aspect of him then his coins are some uh, a spectacle of sorts so we see samudragupta playing musical instruments actually killing a tiger so uh, his prashasti or some other literature about him says he is adorned with uh, thousands of scars so he seems to have been a active soldier and uh, that also goes into the evolving ideas of gupta kingship uh, which was personified by samudragupta and then chandragupta so there uh, they 
the gupta king like maybe, maybe we'll come to that later so that's about samudra gupta ajay what do we know about uh, uh, the early years of samudra gupta were there any specific administrative changes that he brought in so that which helped expand the empire not just in terms of the geographical area but also in terms of its ability to oversee kingdoms down south uh no uh, because you know the tragedy of ancient indian history is that if this prashasti did uh, would not have survived okay so uh, it was only because of this prashasti we know that this conquest took place if there was no prashasti would we would not have known that this you know great man once lived so what we know about his conquest is only through his prashasti And so do we know anything else about his kingdom through this prashasti yes uh, so now about prashasti and you know it mentions as gorav ji has said that you know it mentions multiple kingdoms which he conquered but the uh, this uh, prashasti mention did not talk about you know the chronological order of the conquest but it talks about geographical region of how you know which country was conquered first so when you analyze this uh, prashasti what we find is that there were four types of conquest that took place or four categories of conquest so the first conquest was the conquest of aryavart the term is used in the prashasti so aryavart basically is the region of northern india and in aryavart uh, some uh, the, the writer of the prashasti is harishen he was a minister of uh, samudragupta so harishena tells us that uh, samudragupta uh, conquered eight kings and particularly the uh, you know the term is used violently exterminated so uh, in the aryavart region particularly northern india region he you know most likely killed the kings of diff- these eight kings now then the second uh, conquest was the conquest of dakshin of dakshinapath or southern states now in the southern state uh, this prashasti tells us that he conquers 12 rulers uh, 12 rulers are named but uh, the tell, the uh, prashasti tells us that he conquered all the rulers of dakshinapath but 12 are named now the here he did not violently exterminated the rulers of dakshinapath as he did in you know aryavart what he did was the term is used grahan mokshanugrah so grahan is captured mokshan moksh matlab means you know liberated and uh, anugraha matlab re, uh, reinstated so what we see is that first he defeats these rulers of dakshinapath then he liberates them and then he after liberating them reinstate these rulers as a you know feudatory of sorts now this policy makes sense because a, the kind of uh, Uh, administrative structures the guptas had it was not entirely possible to you know govern the uh, territory of uh, the southern uh, region and then the third conquest which he says is that he uh, the border areas of his kingdom so he talks about you know forest states and five border states and nine republics which he reduced to servitude so by this most likely you know he he ensured that they continue to become a, a sometime a, a buffer state a sort of buffer state exist so the concept of raj mandal as uh, gaurav ji has said that this was probably in samudra gupta's mind then the fourth conquest is the uh, is the conquest where we are just told that they you know these rulers particularly the shakas dev putra shahanu shahi which most likely were the later kushanas who ruled the western punjab region and interestingly uh, this prashasti talks about dwellers of simhala which is sri lanka so these uh, kings uh, uh, you know paid obeisance to samudragupta now it is entirely not possible uh, not you know possible that the king of sri lanka paid obeisance but it does suggest that there was some connection so these are the four types of you know categories of conquest which samudragupta did sure uh, gaurav have, do we know anything about what major economic technological social breakthrough 
a samudra gupta initiated which gave him the sort of uh, resources to do all these conquests what drastically changed in the kingdom from the days of his father that he suddenly had all this power were there any alliances were there any major technological breakthroughs that he had which the other kingdoms in the subcontinent did not have we can just uh, make guesses because uh, one thing is that we talked about why magadh uh, was like in the pre modern times especially before the rise of the horse archers with the hunas uh, and advanced cavalry tactics in the later like early medieval and later ancient period before that magadh was like geographically best one of the best located regions to rule because of the traffic on ganga because of uh, st- availability of steel on the chota nagpur plateau and in the vicinity of the magadh region as well as the dependence on like elephants but that doesn't like that is not a full explanation for this time because had that been the case uh, after the fall of guptas some uh, power would have also like uh, another power from magadh would have come up but that is not a uh, robust enough in explanation like i am willing to like if i have to bet i would bet it on the military genius of uh, the man in question samudra gupta which is the case like there were uh, supplementary or uh, supporting uh, things available for him but he probably must have made the most of him most of it right so, so we'll we genius. cannot say anything beyond that yeah uh, right. i will uh, add to what gorav ji has said so huh. uh, you know there is no direct evidence but uh, when we read the raguvamsh of kalidas the kind of army which raguvamsh have which raghu has uh, the kind yeah. of army which is described in the in this uh, play of kalidas we see that you know the they had a heavy cavalry they were the uh, the, uh, the army of raghu was dominated by cavalry so some scholars have argued that the fact that you know uh, uh, this probably means that since the kushanas were you know they were their army was dominated by the cavalry what uh, the guptas uh, did was they learned from the kushanas and particularly they adopted the cavalry tactics of the kushanas and that is why we see that you know this probably made a huge difference when we uh, talk about you know the warfare of this period because uh, most of the armies of ancient india and particularly those of india proper did not have the kind of you know technique or even the, uh, the how to execute a uh, cavalry tactics properly which you know the armies of central asia were known for so this was primarily i think the main reason why the adoption of cavalry technique particularly the heavy cavalry which they learned from the uh, kushanas Right. Uh, i think that may have a truth but i find it difficult to believe uh, because if the if the empire is based in uh, eastern up or in magadh region uh, like over over a period of 100 years or 50 years the supply of horses which was always a problem for any uh, rulers in the interior of the subcontinent so the kushanas they ruled bactria and also they ruled mathura so they could have had smooth supply of horses from afghanistan region because horses do not breed well in india so i am not i am a bit skeptical of this uh, theory about uh, the guptas learning uh, cavalry uh, tactics from kushanas and implementing them like maybe samudra gupta could have but uh, i don't know whether it could have been that successful for this long an empire no sure. there uh, might have been other things i well. think uh, i will just you know just comment on what gorav ji has said Uh, you see when uh, it, this is my view uh, the fact that you know uh, Sam- uh, samudra gupta talks about you know he uh, the shakas and uh, devaputra shahanu shahu shahi paid obedience to the uh, to the uh, to samudra gupta i personally believe that uh, the conquest of northern india took fl- uh, took place first and then he moved to uh, the northwestern frontier and one of the uh, you know one of the policies which i think he may have had uh, he may have had is that uh, he, these uh, shakas or later kushanas must provide him uh, horses horses 
Yeah. So because you know, I think it it makes sense because when we look at his successor Chandragupta II, the fact that he raids the territory of the Bahalikas, crossing the seven Sindhu, uh, seven rivers, seven mouth Sindhu. Suppose I think it shows that you know the supply of horses may have uh, stopped, so he would have to make some type of a punitive raid to this territory because uh, when we look at the reign of Chandragupta II and particularly the his struggle with the Western Kshatraps. So Western Kshatraps controlled the Western coastal region. So they had, you know, easy supply from the Persian Gulf of, of horses. But the uh, but since uh, Chandragupta II did not have any a, a, a supply of horses from the Western coastal region, he needed horse, horse from the traditional land routes so that is why he must have uh, you know uh, raided the territory of uh, the bulk region and ensured the supply of horses which he later used in the campaigns against the shapar right right moving on so samadragupta has sort of built this empire which is pretty much the peak of the gupta empire uh, he is succeeded by his son chandragupta ii also known as vikramaditya gaurav what do we know about him so uh, yeah the origins of his reign are again in mystery so uh, what jay talked about some time ago the devi chandraguptam play so that basically uh, appears to be have been a propaganda uh, like which was paid by chandragupta in some extent which sort of paints a picture that he defeated the earlier uh, ruler who was not competent ramagupta and one of the things interesting about this is uh, chandragupta not only defeated or killed his brother ramagupta but he also married his wife who is the devi in the devi chandragupta and this has been corroborated by some other inscription from 9th or 10th century where a ruler says that he is a great ruler as great as chandragupta the second but he has not married the wife of his ex like dead brother so that seems to have like some uh, it has been corroborated not just by the devi chandra guptam but also by another source so that is an important uh, point uh, yeah that's about the start of his reign but he seems to have been have ushered in what we call as the gupta golden age so uh, by gupta golden age it literally was a gupta golden age because the gold coins of samudra gupta and chandra gupta second and kumara gupta were he- very heavy and they had a lot of gold in them so a lot of these gupta coins have been found across the country and the gold quality is astounding so uh, chandragupta second also conquered the western chatrapas and seems to have uh, brought that region into his territory so that is important because western chatrapas controlled the western ports around mumbai and gujarat which traded with what remained of rome also with uh the sasanian empire and other uh, foreigners so that must have been a cash cow which uh, was under chandragupta so that would have ushered in a golden age of sorts and he also married his daughter prabhavati gupta to uh, vakatakas which also further consolidated the hold of the empire because the largest po- second largest power was an ally and there were no other large powers to challenge the gupta power for next 50 years or so right jay your thoughts on vikramaditya uh, i think chandragupta second is i think the most uh, important ruler because uh, after samudragupta uh, because you know the i will I, i want to focus on the campaign against the shakas because uh, there is this interesting uh, inscriptions that are found from dhilsa which is also called vidisha which is a, which is some 60 km north of uh, bhopal so here what we see is that there are three inscriptions of uh, uh, that belongs to you know chandragupta second's reign now the first inscription is uh, is a inscription which is commissioned by a military officer of chandragupta second then we have another inscription which is commissioned by a foreign minister of chandragupta second then there is the third inscription by a feudatory chief of some chandragupta second so 
you know historian find historians find this inter interesting that in the same region we have a military officer a foreign uh, a foreign minister and also a feudatory chief now both now why are these uh, these three different uh, officers of the chandru of chandragupta second was you know present in this region because they were executing the one of the most important campaigns of chandragupta second's reign which were which was against the western kshatras and uh, this campaign which uh, you know must have taken i think around 5 uh, to 10 years for him to conquer the western kshatra region was extremely important because uh, when you when we talk about the western kshatras they had ruled this uh, western uh, uh, western uh, india western subcontinent region so basically the uh, uh, the region of uh, gujarat and some parts of uh, uh, maharashtra so they have ruled this region for at least 300 years and they had first you know uh, struggled with the satvahanas so the satvahanas has uh, had declined but they still remained so this struggle was very important for the uh, for chandragupta second now the importance can or or the when this discover, when this victory finally happened uh, one of the you know for the chandragupta second how important this victory was or how symbolic this victory was can be seen from the caves of udaygiri udaygiri which is in dhilsa or vidisha now here there is this varaha cave in which we have you know the varaha avatar or of bhagwan vishnu in which uh, varaha is is a boar so i think most of us know about this story you know varaha uh, rescues the bhu devi or prithvi so some scholars have uh, argued that you know this uh, why did the guptas uh, particularly chandragupta second uh, chose this uh, this uh, sculpture to uh, to be depicted here so one can sense that you know he just like uh, the varaha avatar of uh, lord vishnu has uh, you know rescued the bhu devi similarly chandragupta second has rescued this territory from the clutches of the western kshatras so i think this uh, this fact is interesting in my view right what about what what happens next so after vikramaditya gaurav what do we know about the succeeding kings and how did they take the empire yeah. forward yeah so then we have kumara gupta the first uh, who seems to have reigned for a lot of time uh, the early part of his reign was one of lot of peace but then he faced some challenges uh, particularly three a civil war broke up uh, in the in the gupta gupta region itself so one of the uh, cousins or brothers of kumara gupta uh, with maybe some help from the vakatakas rebelled and uh, kumara gupta first had to like subdue them so that sort of uh, brought some friction in between the guptas and vakatakas which had been going strong for last 30 40 years or so so they, that was one uh, challenge he faced then there were pushyamitras who also who also rebelled and he had to like put them down and at uh, during the reign of kumara gupta first himself uh, first set of uh, huna uh, invaders who are called kidarites or white huns they invaded and they were also beaten back by kumara gupta's armies uh, led by uh, his son probably his bastard son uh, skanda gupta who was the next great uh, gupta emperor right jay your thoughts uh, about kumara gupta's reign uh, as gaurav ji has said you know this was the reign of uh, his successors have conquered this vast territory so a king is needed to consolidate the you know the vast empire of the guptas so this task was primarily done by kumar gupta now among the you know different gold coins which were issued by different gupta kings the most excellent and the most the large amount of coins or gold coins particularly belong to his reign and you know this uh, sense of uh, this sense of peace or the sense of you know the golden age 
which was uh, which uh, ushered in during this period can also be seen from the fact that uh, kumar gupta first we are told also performed a ashwamed sacrifice so this is important now uh, our, as gaurav ji has said that after uh, during the end of his reign we find that uh, there is this huna invasion now i don't think that uh, skand gupta who was the son of uh, kumar gupta first was particularly a bastard child i think he was not he was he was the uh, son of a wife but not the chief wife his chief uh, yeah probably hmm. so now this uh, then we find that you know skand gupta becomes the next gupta emperor uh, i will i want to uh, there is this inscription in gazipur uh, up which uh, they, this is a stone pillar inscription which which you know which was commissioned by skand gupta which talks about you know how he defeated the uh, defeated his enemies so this is a interesting inscription so i will i want to read that and i quote when his father had died he conquered his enemies and established again the ruined fortunes of his lineage and then crying the victory has been achieved he took himself to his mother whose eyes were full of tears from joy just as krishna when he had slain his enemies he took himself to his mother devaki so you know the fact that uh, after the end or during the end of kushan uh, sorry uh, kumar gupta's reign there was this turmoil within the gupta realm can be seen from this inscription where uh, you know it was because of skand gupta that finally the fortunes of the guptas was finally destroyed and about what the, uh, what language uh, jay what language is this inscription in sanskrit pure sanskrit classical sanskrit so uh, was that the language of the court of the guptas yes. classical yes. sanskrit yeah. yes if you know this was the period when classical sanskrit you know achieved its greatest height which i think after this period it was the classical period of sanskrit literature also right now so moving on to second gup so we already have spoken about him how does his reign end what about him? what what about his rule we know how he got onto the throne and uh, what he achieved while he was there what about his i uh, think uh, uh, i will just add that uh, it's skand gup i skand gup ha because you know uh, i used to pronounce the this name and you know my father used to scold me so you so i think uh, skand gup is the exact skand gup right so what do we know about uh, the reign of skand gup were there any major administrative reforms or was he just keeping the kingdom as going as a going concern now uh, you know one of the major uh, adv- achievements of some uh, so skand gupta's reign was that you know he he defeated the hunas because you know the kind of uh, enemy they were can be seen from the fact that when the hunas were defeated by skand gupta they turned towards the persians and uh, in 484 we are told that the sasanian king firoz was defeated and killed by these huns so you know the fact that he secured his uh, his territory from the ravages of the hunas this was i think the main achievement and he did not ruled very much he ruled for only around i think around 12 years so within mm. this 12 years he was able to you know secure his uh, secure india from the huna invasion and secured he was able to secure it for at, i think at least 50 years so it was only after 50 years we see that another huna invasion takes place so i think this was the main achievement of uh, skand gupta's reign so we've covered the five main uh, gupta kings let's uh, move on to the religious interplay in their reign so this is the time when buddhism jainism the vedic religion everything sort of made an appearance on the subcontinent and there are like we discussed in the earlier episodes uh, there are various uh, you know dynamics of these religions and these religious orders which religious order sort of prevailed and guptas were the followers of which religion gaurav would you like to take that yeah so uh, one thing uh, to add is the vedic religion or what we call today as hinduism that uh, the previous uh, rulers of the subcontinent so the uh, after the fall of uh, mauryas most of the rulers uh, paid obeisance to some form of hinduism 
they may not have been the bhagavata uh, followers as the guptas were but hinduism already like what we know as hinduism had already made a strong statement before the time of the guptas the guptas were followers of vishnu or were the or they called themselves as parama bhagavata followers of bhagavata so they their whole world view seems to have been shaped by uh, this so uh, the vaishnavism seems to have made a lot of uh, impact on their politics as well as their their personal life so the uh, what we talked about uh, samudra gupta when we talked about samudra gupta and what his coins talk about uh, it so he also uh, performed the ashwamedha sacrifice probably he performed the ashwamedha sacrifice twice because we have two different types of ashwamedha coins uh, and the ideal chakravarti ruler that also concept is uh, which some scholars say was a buddhist concept which was later taken by the uh, brahmanical fold or some say that it was a pre like uh, older vedic concept uh, we will not go into that but the chakravarti samrat concept seems to have made a uh, comeback like comeback or uh, taken a new avatar that is a good pun uh, during the gupta era so the ruler is not exactly a god but he is like he is often compared to the gods and that is contrasted with the previous great em- emperors of the country who were kushanas they were actually uh, they uh, the kushanas actually called themselves sons of gods whereas the guptas compared themselves to the gods so uh, jay already mentioned about the udaygiri cave complex so uh, some of the most fantastic uh, achievements of the gupta era is that complex so we have the varaha sculpture then uh, there were lot of water works over there uh, that particular place also had a lot of cosmological significance because apparently that was the region udaygiri hills was the region from which we uh, ancient indians were observing uh, solstices so after the after the june date uh, uh, monsoons arrive so that also gives the added advantage uh, like the added importance to the udaygiri complex and uh, there are some uh, rituals even today in many vishnu temples where vishnu is put to sleep so that also may, uh, those concepts also were sort of shaped by the guptas the itihasas probably the last last redactions or the last forms of the itihasas were already there but they may have become more popular then we know for sure that the puranas took their final forms during the time of the guptas so that we can know so what what we understand as classical hinduism that surely that is recognizable clearly after the time of guptas so we have the dashavatar mandir which has the avatara history so we talked about varaha so so on and so forth uh, that is about hinduism what we understand as hinduism but buddhism was also patronized by the guptas especially the later guptas so na, the a famous world famous nalanda university that uh, would have been commissioned by some of the later guptas or even the com- uh, construction may have begun during the reign of kumara gupta himself right jay your thoughts what was the religious interplay hmm. i think i will you know go through the entire uh, entire gupta ruler uh, chronology to you know give the uh, to give the to, to show how you know how different uh, how complex this whole thing was so as gaurav ji has said you know they were followers of vaishnav religion and uh, most importantly the symbol of the guptas was garuda so so this was their one can say you know the they were this was their religion patron of the vaishnavas uh, but what we see is that as i have already you know described these three inscriptions which is found in vidisha of chandragupta second's reign during this period now in these three inscriptions you know, one can see how diverse the gupta uh, kingdom or the gupta even the gupta court was so for example you know the the feudatory of chandragupta second the, the inscription talks about you know construction of a vaishnava temple 
and uh, so this was done by a feudatory of chandragupta second now within the within the same locality we have another inscription of a military officer of chandragupta second whose name was amrakar dev now amrakar dev is uh, telling us that he has donated uh, some you know he had made some donation to a buddhist monastery then we have uh, within the same locality another inscription of a foreign minister of chandragupta second whose name was vis virasena so virasena is telling us that he constructed a cave for shambhu or shiv as we call it, call him so you know the fact that within in the same locality you have three different uh, religions or three different uh, traditions that are being you know respected or that are being flourishing tells us how vibrant the gupta realm was and when we uh, you know come to the later guptas although they are you know they they were followers of vaishnav uh, vaishnav sect but we see that by the time of narsim gupt who narsim gupt second particularly who ruled around 520 uh, ad we find that you know uh, the chinese sources tells us that he was you know great patron of buddhism and there is this particular phase that uh, the east uh, which tells us that the e, the east up to sea the eastern region up to sea was decorated with chatyas so what we uh, so initially they started as patrons of vaishnav religion and they were you know quite uh, uh, quite devoted to this religion but by the end of the guptas we see that they have become you know great patrons of buddhism and zealous patron if we uh, consider the chinese sources right so, right right moving on uh, what do we know about developments in mathematics and science in this era one of the most prominent personalities of this era is a mathematician called aryabhatta gorab why don't you take that uh, what do we know about this aspect of yeah. the so the one of the works of aryabhatta aryabhatti or like i don't uh, exactly know the name that survives and aryabhatta clearly has like done a lot and we don't need to like maybe go into details because that is a household name today but uh, some misconceptions i would like to clear uh, the invention of zero sort of in pop culture in many spheres is given to aryabhatta but zero as a concept was known to indians quite at quite some time before aryabhatta as well and when we talk about zero uh, there are many things about zero like it is uh, what we call shunyata the denotion of something which is not there or as a decimal separator or as a placeholder so even ancient cultures like babylonians egyptians mayans they had some understanding of zeros uh, what what seems to have happened in india particularly is that zero as a numeral was used so one of the evidences of that comes from a manuscript called uh, bakshali manuscript which is found in uh, some region in pakistan which goes to this era 3 or 3rd or 4th century ad some of the radiocarbon dating goes back to that but there is some contestation about that Uh, so that seems to have denoted zero as a numeral for one of the earliest evidences of that so coming to aryabhatta he approximated pi to the fourth or fifth decimal he also came up with trigonometric terms we uh, understand as sine and cosine they were called as something else i think ardhyaja or koti or kotija or something and there is a claim that uh, the word sine and cosine so uh, all this understanding mathematics came went to the latin world via arabic and uh, some people claim i will have to, like this is not uh, 100% sure but zero went into zipper which uh, no shunya shunya became zipper which became uh, zero same is the true for ja and koti ja which seem to have become sin and cosine then uh, something else with aryabhatta came up with was he explained earth's rotation about its own axis uh, so he was one of the earliest person to speculate that he also gave so, so i'll just interrupt for... you there gorav and just interrupt you there so nice of you to tell us about aryabhatta but generally what else do we know about the 
progress of uh, science and mathematics during the gupta era yeah so about science particularly one of the uh, fascinating specimens we have is the iron pillar of uh, kutub complex which we already talked about so that is a pillar from 1600 years ago and that is still not corroded so uh, the way in which ancient indians smelted iron that seems to have been different from the way outside cultures were smelting iron so uh, i think the heating uh, the iron was not heated to that extent where it was as it was heated in the west and some of the uh, some of the compounds which are formed at, on the outer ring of that iron pillar that may be like because of the process of uh, iron smelting which was pretty advanced for that time uh, so that made sort of uh, reasonably corrosion free iron so uh, the udaygiri complexes we talked about uh, the water engineering at that place was also uh, like exceptional so we can be pretty sure that there would have been other uh, aspects of the technology like uh, construction and things which would have been advanced by the gupta times right ajay your thoughts on the science and technology and the developments that we had in this era uh, about science and technology particularly i think you know the advancement in metallurgy i think gorav ji has already talked about astronomy and mathematics i think these are the two te- two specific you know subjects where uh, the gupta uh, period you know greatly excelled during this period uh, we have uh, r f hat Uh, although we you know exa- exactly don't know the period during which he uh, he existed but uh, but it is clear that it was earlier than 7th century b uh, 7th century ad then there were uh, two other i think important personalities whose name is varahamir and brahmagupta now the i think brahmagupta is is important because he wrote a text called brahmasput siddhant now this text is interesting because it it you know it is the only surviving text which tells us you know what kind of uh, equipments which were used uh, in you know astron- astronomical measurements and how when one has used these uh, in scr- in these instruments how to take the readings and calculate the readings from then on so these these all advancements tells us that you know the gupta age was a period during which science and technology greatly flourished and then you see we have uh, the coins of the guptas for example and the fact that you know uh, these were beautifully crafted coins means that you see there was some advancement in the way coins were manufactured essentially these co- these advancement were introduced uh, were introduced by the indo greeks because the die struck uh, technique was came from there so i think this is the overall picture right moving on to the literature and philosophy of this era uh, one of the most prominent personalities of this era gaurav is kalidas what do we know about him what's his back story so about his back story like we have a lot of uh, evidences about him but all of them are later evidences so <laughs> one as late as i think 16th or 17th century which which gives a fanciful tale about how he was a devotee of kali who like because of some marital problem he became a devotee of kali and who gave him a blessing of extem for extemporious almost extemporious poetry composition so on and so forth so but about him personally we don't know much because all these sources are contradict each other uh, we can be pretty sure that he was sent like uh, some scholars think that he was sent by chandragupta the uh, second to the court of the vakatakas where the prabhavati gupta was uh, regent uh, to guide and teach his uh, her sons who were going to be the later vakataka uh, rulers so some of the compositions of kalidasa are timeless apparently so what jay talked about raghuvamsha so the story of raghu so that also uh, is a work like uh, that is given to kalidasa so that talks about the conquests of uh, the ruler raghu 
uh, and it seems to have been modeled on Samudra Gupta and maybe some part of Chandra Gupta as well. Right. Were there any schools of philosophy that flourished? Uh, so, one of the interesting things uh, we talked about, about zero. So, we have not talked about the Jainas till now. So, we talked about Buddhists, we talked about uh, Vaishnava religion. So, uh, uh, touching about zero, so the Jaina philosophers seem to have worked a lot on zero and that may have been because of the metaphysical, uh, uh, metaphysics of uh, Jainism. So, some uh, uh, Jaina work called Loka Bhibhava or something. So, that uh, discusses zero and lot about Shunnata. So, that is something we missed. Right. So apart from that, uh, philosophies, uh, Buddhist works were still going as we talked. So one of the tutors of uh, Narasimha Gupta, I forget his name. Let me just look it up. Uh, Jay, do you remember the uh, uh, tutor of uh, Narasimha Gupta who seems to have been a famous Buddha ruler, uh, Buddha Vasubandhu. teacher? Va Vasubandhu, yeah. So he was one of the, like a Buddhist philosopher of sorts who seems to have had a great influence on uh, Narasimha Gupta. Right. Jay, yeah, your he thoughts... was a Mahayana. Yeah, so Mahayana Buddhism also came into its own during this period. So Vasubandhu was a philosopher of uh, Mahayana Buddhism, the greater vehicle Buddhism. Right. Jay, your thoughts on the uh, philosophy and uh, the literature of this era? I think uh, this was the period, you know, when uh, Bud Buddhism really uh, flourished in China, particularly. And one of the main personalities of uh, the person who, you know, uh, did the heavy lifting during this period was Kumar Ajeev. Kumar Ajeev is interesting because his father belonged to Kashmir and uh, he existed around 343 AD. And uh, what we are told is that. Uh, Kumar Ji then goes to a monastery in China and there he lives for around 12 years. Now, uh, from this, when he is living in this monastery, he translates, you know, the major Buddhist work into Chinese. So, you know, uh, the fact that uh, the monastery is being, you know, Kumar Ji is traveling in this region and uh, it was probably because of his influence, we see that uh, the Chinese uh, religion, uh, Chinese Buddhism, you know, suddenly ex uh, greatly, you know, increases or uh, his so the importance Buddhism expands and Buddhism finds its feet in China, right? Yes. Right. So, uh, what do we know about the end of the empire? What are the factors that finally lead to the age of the Guptas coming to an end? Gaurav, you would you like to take that first? Yeah, so something we talked about earlier, during Kumara Gupta's reign itself, the Gupta Vakataka alliance was broken. Not exact, they were not exactly at war, but the, there was some friction always after that, that time. So that sort of we can see as beginning of the end in a way. So then uh, internal rebellions had begun. And then we, uh, we came to the first uh, Huna invasions of the white huns or the Kedarites. So that was defeated by uh, Skandagupta himself. But during the reign of Skandagupta himself, uh, the uh, gold coins, the quality of gold coins seems to be reducing. And uh, that is uh, hence considered as the beginning of the end. But then as you like, uh, uh, when the Guptas first uh, lost the control over the western part of the country, which was a very which was giving a lot of riches to them because of the sea trade so they they would have started becoming uh, like more and more powerless to defeat incoming invaders but still they sort of managed to hold on uh, but i think the final uh, blow was given by the alcon huns who invaded around 6th century uh, under the Alkon Han ruler uh, Toran, Toramana and uh, his son Mihirakola. So they were both defeated by Indian rulers. Uh, these Huns were uh, early, they were maybe Iranic worshippers, 
but on coming into india they they adopted shaivism mihira kula seems to have been a devotee of uh, shiv so they kept on uh, like invading from the northeast and finally like after narsimha gup it seems that the later guptas were just uh, small regional players who were not playing any role anywhere so that is one uh, uh, the military aspect of it also i think in 5th century there were some there were series of droughts unless i'm uh, so that may have that so all the falls fall of empires so to speak are assisted by geographical and climatic calamities like that so that also must have played a role but uh, an interesting part about uh, the tora uh, of the alkon han uh, huna rulers uh, toramana and mihira kula which we talk about so uh, in ancient indian history at least uh, sectarian violence seems to not have been that mainstream but one of the few rulers in the indian history about whom we can certainly say that he persecuted some other religious sect is mihira kula so who seems to have been persecuting uh, buddhists he was a huna invader who became a follower of shiva and began persecuting buddhists or so lot of uh, independent sources rajat like the i think kalhana's work buddhist sources seem to corroborate it and he was fought back by the buddhist sympathizing narasimha gupta so that is also an important like interesting just uh, juxtaposition into the fall of the gupta empire jay your thoughts i think uh, when we are talking about the decline of the guptas there were in my view there were essentially two factors that led to their decline first was the internal factor so as earlier you know gaurav ji talked about the title of the guptas now uh, the guptas used this you know uh, great titles like maharaja diraj parmeshwara etc now one of the reasons why they used these titles was because they had this you know feudatory form of government in which uh, feudal lords rule, used to rule in different regions of the empire the term which is used is samant now what we see is mm-hmm. that when the gupta king was a strong king he used to control these samantas but by the end of the uh, particularly during the reign of later guptas we see that uh, this uh, these samantas have gained influence and they were exerting you know their independent status so one example which we can uh, see is that uh, the the gupta empire is divided into different uh, into different uh, provinces which are called uh, bhuktis or uh, so these bhuktis or uh, some were 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 under the governors who are called uparikas now during the reign of kumar gupt first we see that most of the uparikas used the term uparika but by the time of buddha gupt so buddha gupt ruled around the end of 5th century so around 4 476 ad to 495 ad now during this period we see that you know the uparikas have u- started using the term maharaj uparika so this shows that you know the kind of uh, uh, control which the the later gupta rulers had over the samantas was not you know not not what not really great then there was the external uh, you know factor which was mainly the invasion of the hunas so the first uh, invasion as uh, uh, is defeated by skand gupta so around 500 ad i think uh, if we exactly don't know the date so the uh, the huna ruler torman invades and uh, what we see is that by the uh, by 510 uh, 510 ad he had conquered the region of northwest so bihar uh, punjab uh, these are all conquered and even the region of malwa is also conquered and from there is this you know koshambi which is uh, in uh, ilahabad region or prayagraj region now here we have a inscription of Tom, torman where we see that you know it is pretty sure that his rule extended up to this region so this was you know the home home territory of the guptas and there are multiple reference which suggest that the guptas of this period 
were reduced as some they were forced to pay tribute to Thormana. And uh, uh, now his uh, his son, whose name is Mihir Kula. Now Mihir Kula is uh, is finally defeated by the by the you know by the Narsim by the Gupta ruler Narsim Gup II. But what we see is that in this defeat, Narsim Gup did not play the major role. It was the feudatory of the Guptas whose name is Yasho Yashod Varman. Who was from the Malava region, and there was this on, uh, another Maukri chief, Ishwar Varman. So Maukris were the rulers, uh, were the Savantas of Kannauj region. So these two uh, feudatories, you know, they played the major role in defeating the uh, defeating the uh, armies of Mihirkula. Now we see that you know when the when Mihirkula is defeated and he goes to uh, Gandhar. Uh, so what happens during uh, in this area is that by the uh, re- when we read the inscriptions of Yashod Marvan, he is telling that he has conquered all the worlds. Uh, everybody is you know paying obedience to him. So this suggests that now since you know he was the main person who has defeated Mihirkul, he was ass- asserting his you know identity or his power. So. By the end of 5, uh, 550 AD, we see that um, the Guptas were reduced as minor players, and the region of Bengal was ruled by them. Right, right. So, on a, to wrap up the episode, what's the legacy of this period? Oh, what is it? Uh, what did the Guptas do? What did they build uh, that survived the following centuries? Yeah. So yeah. So one thing to add before uh, the legacy of Guptas uh, is uh, an interesting thing to note. We talked about this uh, ruler Toramana, and uh, we talked about the religious. Uh, we talked about the Varaha statue in uh, Udaygiri caves. So one of the important inscri- inscriptions of uh, Toramana is also a Iran is also called Iran Bor, which is also a tribute to Varaha. So. these invaders like the uh, it's interesting to note that the first invader also took up the religion of the place and he was like uh, building motifs of vaishnavism within a generation so that is something uh, wanted to add here before and another thing is after the uh, after the beginning of the fall of the guptas there was another age called as the vakataka golden age so uh, the reason for that uh, uh, seems to be that after uh, guptas lost control over the western part of the country the vakatakas who were the former ally, allies and later enemies of the guptas gained control over those uh, uh, rich ports of the west and they seems to have had a small a brief golden age and that golden age is attested in the beginning of the ajanta caves so everyone in india must be knowing of the fantastic ajanta elora cave complexes the elora came come from a later time but the uh, vast amount of ajanta caves some of them were uh, sponsored by the vakataka rulers during the time we are talking about around 4th and 5th century uh, not exactly 4th i think 5th century bce after beginning of the fall of the guptas so that is an important uh, thing which we missed so the vakatakas also were a big player and about the legacy of the guptas so something which we covered earlier as well uh, classical hinduism as we know today uh, sort of came became uh, came into being during the gupta age so the puranas were composed the itihasas were uh, like spread the word of the itihasas itihasas was spread the model for indian kingship Uh, which followed seems to have been taken from the guptas and not from the mauryas or the kushanas before them so that legacy definitely was there uh, another thing which uh, is like in current days is given to be a legacy of the gupta rule by some uh, historians is the in the question of uh, varna jati thing is the ossification of jatis so some uh, historians uh, like to think that uh, the legacies of guptas who were uh, uh, as we have talked about patrons of vaishnavism is the ossification of jatis so we have talked about it in some previous podcast as well 
that uh, how last 1500 to 2000 years there has not been intermarriage uh, in indian jatis and some historians today retrospectively think that that is the legacy of the gupta age but i myself am not at all convinced by that explanation though the genetic clock seems to point to the end of the guptas uh, if i would revert to bet i would put the uh, uh, put the reason as the deurbanization which seems to have uh, followed the gupta fall because of the ravages of the hunas so indian subcontinent went through a phase of 100 years of rapid deurbanization in the 6th century and maybe early 7th century bc so that is also that is archaeological you mean c you mean c c sorry yeah c <laughs> no that's okay right right uh, jay your final thoughts uh, uh, i will talk about the legacy first but just about the deurbanization part you see there is this great debate among the historians about this deurbanization thing so uh, uh, just uh, wanted to say that uh, it is not you know there is great literature that has been you know uh, is been written about the fact that there was no deurbanization some historians like you know dilip chakravarty for example he argues that there was no uh, deurbanization during this period because uh, so this is i think uh, this is debatable now about the legacy part i think uh, i would you know like to quote the uh, right uh, quote the famous historian rc majumdar about what he wrote about the gupta period so i so i quote it rose and fell but left a deep impress upon posterity by the standard which it set in all department of life and culture a standard which was alike the envy and despair of succeeding ages its greatness was such that even today after the lapse of 1500 years the gupta age is regarded as the golden or the classical age of india in letters and science as well as in arts and crafts it evoked the highest intellectual expression that india has ever capable of and the religious movements and philosophical speculations which it fostered are still the greatest living forces in indian life so i think this you know sums up the whole legacy of the guptas you know beautifully Wonderful. Yeah. Right. So, Gaurav, before we wrap up, I thought I'll ask you. One of the common references for this era is that it's called the Golden Age of Indian History. Uh, would you like to talk in detail about why is it called that? Yeah, I think that deserves a somewhat elaborate answer. So, uh, in common uh, common memory or in common history, we call this era. as the classical age or the golden age of indian history so how did we how do we come to this i think we'll need some explanation so hinduism hinduism as we define today is something which is which became clearly recognizable during this period i think we touched upon that uh previously but let me elaborate uh, one of the interesting ways to look at hinduism is using the metaphor author rajiv malhotra uses which is called indra's net uh, if i put it in software terms then hinduism can be looked upon as an open architecture based on vedic traditions where different apps and programs can be installed as long as they are compatible with the open architecture if we are to explain using that analogy then the various sampradaya local deity cults slowly got integrated into the vedic architecture the devotional cults of vishnu shiv and devi clearly have some vedic as well as more importantly some non vedic antecedents and in some of the previous podcasts we have talked about how the bhagavata cult emerged in north india and how it may have had its origin in the vedic period in the figures of the vrishni heroes like krishna vasudev samkarshana but by the time of the guptas the bhagavata or the vaishnav religion had become something significantly different the puranas which were composed around these times also played a key role in linking the various cults and deities into a somewhat coherent yet contradictory mythology so apart from vaishnavism 
various traditions like shakta shaivism tantra also become popular according to scholars shaivism was probably more popular at this time before the guptas than vaishnavism because uh, we talked about the naga rulers and the vakatak rulers they were devotees of shiv whereas vaishnava traditions seem more synchronized with the vedic traditions some local cults tantra and shaiva traditions were at times not accepted in the vedic mainstream there have been many stories of initial conflicts of such cults with vedic traditions but these cults slowly got integrated into into the vedic traditions the mechanisms of this integration are a bit varied some deities as we talked about the avatars of vishnu became integrated into the vaishnava pantheon while some became a family of shiva and so on and some had their own complex narratives which were sort of meshed together into the puranas so devi also started becoming interwoven with other deities like the tale of mahishasur mardini so we talked about the udayagiri cave complex before so in my opinion that is one of the fantastic examples of the manifestations of this puranic mythology where we see vishnu both as varaha as well as the reclining sleeping vishnu we see a mukha shiva lingam we see mahishasur mardini we see skanda and ganesh so in a way uh, what uh, i i like to think is the vedic yajna based uh, religion which was more transactional per se gave way to other more devotional forms of worship these these include grand temples teerthak kshetras and uh, what not so Uh, we don't have just temples. i just sort of just sort of interrupt you there so what are we saying yeah. are we saying that this was an era when the religion from being a part and practiced primarily by elite with the elite deciding what would constitutes for a religious practice moved to a more mass following where if i could use the word the there were no intermediaries the religion became a more widespread and a more popular uh, would that be uh, or are we intermediate intermediate intermediary still remained so brahmins and other priests still remained but the devotional aspects of the religion came to the forefront instead of so instead of instead of instead of specific practices which were meant for achieving yes. specific results for the ruling class religion yeah. became more of a mass following and a popular yeah. uh, popular cultural yeah 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 that would be a way to look but these things were also shaped by the rulers because the udayagiri cave complexes uh, one of the fascinating cave complex called pravareshwar temple complex uh, which was patronized by the vakatak were also patronized by large rulers which also played with this uh, flux of change so to speak so that is also a, but so these right. we can see these multiple strands sort of came together into what we understand today as hinduism so for definition of hinduism this is a very crucial period much more so than earlier periods i would say uh, some of the other interesting things which we uh, uh, did not discuss was a famous buddhist monk called faya or fagzian i exactly don't know the uh, chinese pronunciation who visited india for around 12 years uh, probably during the reign of chandragupta vikramaditya so he had some observations like uh, we talked about vegetarianism earlier so he said that around the around the region of mathura people are abstaining not only from meat but also from garlic and onions so we can see that uh, vegetarianism which is linked heavily with vaishnavism was beginning to get uh like take a hold in the situation so that is also one thing we will i'd like to add and uh, by the gold by when we talk golden age we also mean that the architecture and art like reached new heights so we talked briefly about hindu temples so hindu temples clearly go back to the times before guptas but recognizable hindu temple forms Took shape during these times. Earlier temples 
were short constructions around 10 by 10 feet. Temples with their distinctive shikhar, as we today understand, began to be constructed during these times. They didn't reach their uh, true heights till the late medi or middle medieval period. But the medieval period was clearly based all, all around innovations during the Gupta period. Coming to the cave architecture, apart from the Udaygiri and Elephanta caves, which we talked about, cave architecture was predominantly Buddhist, like the Karla caves, Bhaja caves, and more, more spectacularly, the Ajanta caves. So something which we didn't touch upon was the sculpture. Uh, I think in the previous episode, we talked about how the Gandhara style of sculpture evolved in the Gandhar region during the time of the Kushanas and how it was deeply influenced by the influence of the Greeks. Uh, apart from that, two more schools of uh, sculpture called Mathura school and Saranath school also continued and flourished during the Gupta period. So uh, uh, an example of that is the Saranath Buddhas, which are regarded as among the finest specimens of Indian art. Uh, if uh, listeners are interested, they can Google it and check. Uh, another interesting sculpture, uh, which is incidentally located in the Delhi Museum, is the personified terracotta of Yamuna and Ganga rivers. So that uh, sculpture was found in Ahichatra, which is in the Panchal region, uh, which is associated with Guptas because as we talked about earlier, Guptas originated in the Prayag region. So Ganga and Yamuna figures uh, denote Guptas. So that is also an interesting part. So we didn't, uh, I, I think, go deep into drama and uh, other things which are also very important when we come to call some era as golden age or classical age so we we briefly talked about kalidasa but uh, one of his plays which i think we referred to in our earlier episode uh, malavika agnimitram is very famous but apart from that uh, two other uh, plays by him abhinyan uh, on shakuntal abhinyan shakuntal and few other poetry like meghadut are also very famous so uh, maybe we can go a bit briefly into Natya Shastra. I think Shrikant mentioned some in the first episode, how Natya Shastra is one of the uh, fascinating achievements of Indians. So uh, I think the Natya Shastra was composed before the times of Gupta, Guptas, but we have not touched upon it till now. So I think maybe we can briefly touch on that. So what one of I the like yeah. Yeah. Gaur, since we are talking yeah, yeah. of performing arts, just wanted to ask you: mm -hmm. Were these performing arts for uh, were there public performances or were they restricted to court performances? Did the was uh, the there, there were practice? public there right. were public performances, but uh, I wouldn't stretch it to call common men. Mostly restricted to large urban centers, and mostly for the well-to-do crowd. But it was not restricted but, yeah. to court. Uh, not uh, yeah not performance. restricted to courts yeah right. so one of the like one of the achievements or an fascinating thing about indian drama indian art uh, is the concept of ras which is from natya shastra so uh, ras is not exactly emotion but it sort of i mean to say maps on emotion so that uh, what we mean to say by that is audience perform what they want to perform and ras is what is failed or rasa rasa is what is failed by the audience who is watching it and there is a distinction between them so that is uh, like that is a sophisticated way of looking at performing arts so we are not exactly uh, understanding what the artist is saying we are as audience reacting to that and that reaction also has to be uh like developed the expertise in the reaction also needs to be developed by the audience so that is the way the natya shastra and the ancient indians uh, saw drama so it was not just a one way thing uh audience had to put in quite a lot of effort into the performance and only then could they really get the juice or rus out of it so and one con interesting contrast with 
uh, ancient Greeks is that Indians did not seem to have a concept of tragedies. So all the plays and all the stories typically need to end on happy note to have successful uh, dramas made on them, unlike the famous Greek tragedies, so to speak. Interesting. So we we are used to happy endings. I guess that's yeah, another so legacy of that period of modern things, popular cinema. Yeah, something which is prescribed. Apart from that, I think uh, in popular culture, there is a sort of uh, way to look back at Indian drama as if it was more, uh, how do you call it, more uh, open, like because of the sculptures in Khajurao and because of Kama Sutra, that it was more liberal in terms of sexual expression. But when we come to drama, uh, even things like kissing or physical displays of affection were not allowed on stage. Uh, not even, not just that, but even uh, bathing, eating, all these things were not supposed, or even death was not supposed to be displayed or like enacted on stage. So there were, uh, so that is something which we miss when uh, some, some how people want a romantic lens looking back at time. Interesting. And, and what's uh, our reference for uh, this information? How do we know about these things? The Natya Shastra text exists okay. actually. And, and we, have, uh, we have set of, yeah, we have set of dramas. So many of the famous dramas follow the Natya Shastra guidelines. So that is like... We are talking of Bharat Muni's Natya Shastra. Yeah. Right. So we touched upon that in one, one earlier episode, but I yes, yes. wanted to go into yeah detail about that. So another thing I think which we missed is the uh, enhancements in Ayurveda. So uh, in an earlier episode, I think we talked about the Sushrut Samhita and how it ha may have been in the early ve late Vedic or early Mahajanpad period. But uh, between the Sushrut Samhita and the Gupta time, uh, Charak Samhita also uh, made an appearance. Uh, actually, there is a manuscript called the Bauer manuscript, which goes back to the 5th, 6th century. And it gives a fascinating peek into the developments of Ayurveda. Uh, so it actually says that it is it can be seen as commentary on the Charak Samhita. And uh, the text refers to Sushrut, which about whom we talked about earlier, as being the one originally from whom this knowledge came. And he got the knowledge from the king of Kashi. Like that is the story which comes out in the Bauer manuscript. So there were some uh, there were some hospitals and large buildings uh, which also existed in North India. And the Chinese uh, traveler Faya also mentions it. So that is an interesting thing. So we're talking there were significant developments and improvements in the sphere of healthcare in the sphere of popular culture yeah. and performing art as well as architecture. And a lot of these yeah. uh, achievements sort of left a legacy which still are reflected in modern India, especially with the temple architecture. Yeah. And even Ayurved to Ayurved. more or less extent. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, maybe to wrap it up, uh, in previous podcast, uh, I think we talked about Bimbisar uh, and how the idea ideals of Indian kingship were and how by and large Indian kings rarely persecuted religious sects even if they were personally devoted to a competing sect. So there is an argument that, that this made good political and pragmatic sense. Uh, this is the argument made by a section of scholars while looking back at these policies of what we call today as pluralism. So another way maybe to look at this is many of the rulers after the Mauryas, like the Hunas about whom we talked, were foreigners or called Mlenchad by the Brahmins who wrote about them. Uh, like other steppe warriors, these Hunas or Kushanas practice some form of Iranic religion or shamanism like the later Mongols. But in spite of that, in spite of what we talked about Mihirakul, very few ancient Indian rulers resorted to anti-religious zealotry. The Kush, the Hunas about whom we talk, they, they actually went native quite soon. 
these streams of invaders we talked about who came to shape the subcontinent from the mahajanpad period to the fall of the gupta so there are a fair few of them so first we have persians then macedonians bactrian greeks shaka kushans and uh, hunas we find that all these identities are melted in india today so we cannot find anyone who claim to have descended from any of these conquerors seven or eight conquerors who shaped indian politics yet no one today claims heritage from them so indian religions especially hinduism and buddhism in large part absorbed reshaped and styled restyled a lot of faith systems of the invaders so today we cannot like cannot say who were who among us have their ancestors as hunas or kushanas i mean there are some claims but they don't carry much weight so from between the few generations to few centuries all of these invaders went native and in a way what became classical hinduism which came to define what we understand as the indian subcontinent was also shaped by these invaders but the interesting thing is after the hunas the integration of these invaders would stop so to wrap it up i will just end with a quote by upinder singh so she uh, incidentally is daughter of manmohan singh and a lot of my history reading has been based on her so it's a quote for from her book the history of ancient and early medieval india so she says uh, the varied invocations and religious imagery of the royal prashastis and the diverse beneficiaries of royal gifts indicate that royal patronage was not necessarily channelized exclusively in one particular direction this has often been interpreted as a reflection of sort of religious toleration which was fashionable among the ruling elites when seen from the perspective of the royal policy the dispersal of patronage across wide spectrum of beneficiaries made good political sense as it permitted the forging of ties and alliances uh, however important part however this could only take place in a milieu in which these religious traditions and identities were not necessarily seen as mutually exclusive or antagonistic so maybe laying the uh, credit or emphasis of these uh, cultural currents at the feet of the rulers is only half truth maybe the traditions and the philosophies also had a lot to do with that right right great stuff any last uh, comments before we wrap up the episode mm, yeah i think that's it another thing maybe uh, which we left is uh, the roman empire which fell around the time the guptas fell also had been attacked by something which we recollect as huns so how these huns are related to these uh, central asian hunas we still clearly don't know but we can say that they might have been relating and it's interesting how the two great empires of that time fell after uh, onslaughts by central asian nomads who were called whose names were similar hunas and huns right right uh with that uh, i guess we'll wrap up the episode thank you for doing this gaurav thank you for doing this jay we look forward to your company in the upcoming episodes uh, reminding our listeners yeah. once again that speakers will provide and we'll provide as part of episode notes or on- all the reference material yeah thanks manish Tune in next week for Brown.